Hello and welcome, I'm Kira Scribner and today I'm going to wrap up my March. I had a really wonderful March. I read 14 books, six of which were long listed for the Women's Prize, three were graphic novels, three were poetry, and then I had a variety of other things that filled out the rest of my books. But I'm really excited to talk about these. I'm going to dive in first with the first book that I read, which is also a book that is different from many of the other books. It is called Scandalous Confessions of Lydia Bennett Witch. If you've been here for a while, you know I have a soft spot for Austin and I have a huge soft spot for Lydia Bennett. I think that she is such a wonderful character to dive into the very nuances of it and this book really really does it. I'm a really big fan of the way that it melded both humor and fantasy as well as historical fiction and social critique all into one brilliant book. The book that it reminded me most of was The Other Bennett Sister which is another retelling of a Jane Austen book from one of the Bennett sisters but it is looking at Mary. Lydia is known as flirtatious and too rumbunctious and too outspoken and Mary on the other side is known as too serious, too cynical, you know, not very talented at anything. One is too lively, one is too serious. And it's really interesting to see the way that these two authors retold these stories. I love The Other Bennet Sister. It reads very much as a Regency novel and it feels like it could take place in this space. And so does Lydia Bennet. Like it is funny in many places and it has hedge witches and all of these other magical things, but it does really feel like it fits into Pride and Prejudice really well. Like there's nothing outrageous. And even when I've read other retellings, sometimes it feels like this couldn't be an Austen novel. And like for obvious reasons, this couldn't be an Austen, but the writing style felt close enough that it felt like it could have been an Austen novel. And that was really fun. One of my favorite elements is that it makes Kitty a familiar, a cat who, you know, loved Lydia so much and she did her first big magic which made everyone believe that she was human. And there's all of these other aspects that interact with Jane Austen in such clever ways. After my first book, I truly went into my first batch of women's prize books and the first one that I read was The Run the Run and I was so excited for this. I thought that it was going to be a favorite. I was sold on the idea that it was a mother-daughter relationship and the ways that they were impacted by the father and grandfather who wrote about them and wrote about birds and wrote about women but was not very involved in their lives. And there was the glamour around who he was and the reality of who he was and how muses are affected by that and I thought it was going to be brilliant and I was just bored throughout and I thought that it wasn't as deep as I wanted it to be. We see a lot of stream of consciousness thoughts but I didn't feel like I was inside these characters heads or that I really understood them as people and I also thought that the secondary characters were just really lacking. The mother and daughter weren't badly drawn but they didn't have a support system around them and they didn't spend much time around each other so I just felt very like if you really like Trespasses from last year's Women's Prize, I feel like you might like it. I had similar problems with that where I felt like the characters weren't close enough, but it also has a big dash of Sally Rooney vibes. The second book that I picked up from the Women's Prize was And Then She Fell by Alicia Elliott, and I was overjoyed when this was longlisted because she's a local author to me, and I really didn't know if a magical realism Indigenous Canadian book would make the booger long list, and I'm so glad that it did because it was an excellent book. It really traces Alice, who is from Six Nations, Ontario, and it is the story of her growing up and experiencing racism and sexualization and then her as a young adult who gets married to a white man and has a new child and her mother has just recently died and she has all these swirling insecurities and fears as she's having a hard time attaching to her daughter as well as her husband who is a professor has also presented her as this person who's writing a creative story and as a writer and she doesn't really know if she can do it and she just feels like she's going to fail and fail and fail. Meanwhile her neighbors and store clerks and everyone around her is monitoring her and patrolling her and she's getting lots of microaggressions. And I think if any of those elements appeal to you, you should really pick up this book because it is such a good book. And from there I took a right turn into Poetry Land beginning with Pretty Boys or Poisonous by Megan Fox. Did I think this was going to be excellent? No. Did I want to read it because Megan Fox has an interesting place in my life from a young age? Yes. And I do plan to do an entire review talking about this and reading some of the lines because I think that this book is really interesting. I think a lot of people will say that it's badly written poetry or she's just a pop star and all of these things. I think that she sometimes uses $4 words to sound sophisticated when she could have just said something more plainer and truer and it would have been a better book. But I also feel like there's a power behind someone who's known as the sex pot and known as all of these things to talk about the abuse and sexualization and how that affected her. And I also think that it does say powerful things about abuse. Is it the best written poetry ever? Absolutely not. Is it the best written book? No. But does it have more of an audience because of who wrote it? Yes. And do these things maybe trade off? 
I'm not sure. My next book is also poetry, and this is Mary Jane Chang's poetry collection, Bright Fear. I heard about her first when she was a judge for the Booker Prize last year, and then when she was shortlisted for the Jalak Prize, which celebrates diverse writing in Britain, I also became intrigued. And I was like, I don't think my library will have it, but my library did have it. And I read it in an afternoon and I really liked it. It is one of those poetry collections that inspired me to write. I like to think that I am a poet and that one day I'll publish my poetry, but I haven't been writing nearly as much lately. And this poetry collection just made me think about writing, it made me think about race and belonging and identity, and her poetry was just so breathtaking. She talked about the experience of being Asian in the pandemic, she talks about race and immigration and language, and she also talks about being a writer herself. And I think that I really enjoyed some of the poems about that. I love metafiction and I love when writers talk about being writers. So I am going to read two poems by her because I think that reading poems is the best way to know if you would like poetry. And there are so many poems that I could have chosen from. These are just two that I had screenshotted that I wanted to share. Perhaps poetry is nothing but a struggle to translate weight of flesh against bone into syllables that sound the shape of things. Leaf, light, tree, sky, the fact of your face, beautiful like breath. I think that that is so beautiful and talks about the experience of being a poet and writing poetry. I also really liked a poem and I will probably butcher the way that she wrote it, but the premise of it is that she's talking about how a writer opens a word doc and it's opened and she starts poetry and she first puts it in nonfiction and then changes it to fiction. And I think that is so true. I think that as you engage with writing, as you engage with poetry, you may have aspects of yourself or those around you, but it's also fictitious in the way that it writes about. And I love writing poetry and I think one of the things that holds me back from publishing or sharing more of my poetry is that poetry is so autobiographized. There's another poem and she talks a lot about her family from Hong Kong and their experiences and this one is just, it's called Hindsight and I think that it's really beautiful. All the ingredients necessary for happiness. I grew up well-fed years away from conflict and its aftermath. When someone in the family knows sacrifice is the only currency, such knowledge seeps. History must suffice. My mother knew hunger. Bread in the absence of a miracle cannot yield more loaves. I will give myself the mango stones, save the sweet flesh for someone else. Save the sweet flesh for someone else. I will give myself the mango stone. A miracle cannot yield more loaves. My mother knew hunger. Bread in the absence of history must suffice. Such knowledge seeps. Sacrifice is the only currency when someone in the family knows conflict and its aftermath. I grew up well fed, years away from all the ingredients necessary for happiness. I think that you could have only those few lines, you know, I grew up well fed, away from all the ingredients necessary for happiness, when contradicting that with her mother's experience of knowing hunger and the bread and absence and all of those things. And as she says, when someone in the family knows sacrifice is the only currency, like it's it's so beautiful. And through this, she also has a poem called Call From Home, where she talks about talking to her mother and the way that things are unsaid. And I just think that it resonates so deeply in the experiences of trying to translate your experiences and how you can be well fed and given love, but be absent of many things that matter. I just think that she's a really brilliant poet and I really hope my library gets more of her books because I wanna read more of them. The next book that I read was also a poetry collection and this was one that has been on my TBR for a while. It is called Bittersweet and it is by a Canadian author from Scarborough. Scarborough is a borough of Toronto and I live nearish Toronto, on the other side of Toronto. I live in Kitchener-Waterloo, which is another mid-sized city near big cities and I feel very passionate about my city and write about it a lot. And you know, it is the city that ushered me into adulthood. I grew up in Ottawa, but then I moved here. I'm an incredibly sentimental person and this is a poetry collection that looks at sentimentality and of place and the ways that we think and I love that it was so rooted and I definitely had to look up aspects of this because I was not that familiar with Scarborough. I know where it is on the highway but I've never really spent time in it so yeah I, I love that the poetry exists. I was not that drawn in. I liked poems here and there but none of the poems really blew me away and it didn't you know propel me and I was reading this right after Mary Jean Chan's book and she is a seasoned poet who has written a lot. So I love love letters to our cities and our stories and our histories and to family and to friends and yeah I think that it's a powerful book in those aspects but it didn't blow me away. 
I read all of these as ebooks from my library and I decided to continue the trend with reading the first volume of One Piece. I've not read the anime and I've not read it before but I watched the live action and I really really liked it. I love a band of people together just loving life and having adventures and I thought it was really funny. So I picked this up and I definitely had a good time. I know so much of the things that happened that it wasn't as drawing forth and I wonder if I wasn't so connected to Luffy or Zoro or those characters if I would have been as entranced by all of this but I am planning on continuing. The next two books that I'm going to talk about are also women's prize books and the first one is Night Bloom and this is by an author that I have read before and really loved her book and I quite like this book too. It was a very solid four star and is probably topping the list of books from the women's prize this year. I also really liked And Then She Fell so it's a tight race but this book I really loved. It follows two cousins, Akofa and Selassie and they have very different childhoods but they are very connected and after the death of Selassie's mother their lives begin to diverge more and it's very interesting because we follow a Kofa story and all the way until her 30s and then we go back and follow the same instances from Selassie's story and that might sound repetitive but it really isn't. Mehdi is very good at streamlining the stories so a Kofa's story really gives all the beats of information and storytelling and place and setting so that we see all the events and then Selassie's story really focuses on the aspects that are very different in each other's perception and the places in which Akofa's perception is really missing in the understanding of Selassie's story. And then the end sees these two women in their 30s coming together and having interactions in this new world because they both saw their childhoods and youth so differently. And I think it's a really powerful story about generational trauma and the way that perception and stories and reputation can really influence the way that we see each other. Most of the book is set in Ghana and Selassie stays in Ghana but Akofa moves to the United States for school and we see her experience of being a black student in the universities and all of the racism and microaggressions that happened to her there as well as into her career and all of those elements. And I think that it's a really powerful book that covers a lot of hard topics and I would look into some of the trigger warnings because some of these are very hard but I don't think that Mehdi ever does it in a way that feels exploitative or graphic and it is discussed very well. The next book is also a women's prize book and this is Enter Ghost by Isabella Hamad and it tells the story of Sonia returning after 20 years away from Palestine. She grew up in Britain with a Palestinian father and a Dutch Palestinian mother but she spent every summer going to Palestine and we see some of those experiences in the 1990s and she goes to visit her sister shortly after her divorce and she is an actress by trade and she meets Miriam who is a director who is doing Hamlet in Arabic and it is a really delightful story if you like art and thinking about how art is talked about and reinvented. If you love Shakespeare, I'm a big fan of Shakespeare and this made me so happy but it also made me feel creative. Both It and Bright Fear brought out similar parts in me of just wanting to feel creative because it's taking elements and retelling it and talking about the ways in which you can get creative performances out of there which I really really loved. You know we have different ways in which they're trying to get the different characters to feel the feels so like when they're trying to feel anger they're like imagine that this is an Israeli police officer or imagine this trauma from your life and I think that it's a really effective way on how we render emotion and has this element of surveillance and the Israeli oppression going on in the background this whole novel and it is a book that I really really enjoyed and that I gave four stars and then after Enter Ghost I decided to break it up with something a little bit more light and I read She-Hulk volume one and I had started this way back and I restarted again this is by Rainbow Rowell if anyone is a fan of her I previously read Fangirl and Eleanor and Park and I really liked Fangirl at the time. Eleanor and Park I did not like as much but yes I would know if those books would hold the test of time but this is more romance than anything and it also really looks at Jen who is reinventing herself and is struggling a little bit and I also read the second one as well a little bit later in the month but I will talk about these together and yeah if you like more slice of life comics about a girl being a lawyer and just having the worst luck of everyone who is a mutant or in space or superhero of some kind is wanting her to represent her and it is humorous but it also has other intrigues going on in the background. I'm hopefully going to read both three and four in April so yes I'm having a delightful time with this series. The next book that I read was Eight Lives of Century Old Trickster and this book is also in the Women's Prize. You know we're seeing a theme and this one is very graphic but also very fast-paced which kind of balances it a little bit. I had a really hard time with the beginning of this book but by the end I've been won over a little bit. It begins with the framing device of this woman 
who's writing obituaries for the seniors who live in her retirement home. And there's one woman named Mrs. Mook who comes in and claims that she's been all of these things. It is set in South Korea, which I loved. I've never read a South Korean book that was not translated and that was really interesting. And yeah, it, it follows this woman who says that she spent time in North Korea, that she was a spy, a traitor, a lover, a mother, a terrorist, all of these things and it really dives into her life. And some of these stories I really liked. I liked the ones which went back and forth between multiple characters. I really liked the spy chapters, surprise, surprise. I also really liked the mother and the daughter one and the lover. All of those eras as we kind of got later into the series, I definitely liked them more than the first ones, but even liking those chapters, it didn't completely win me over. One of my biggest complaints is that the framing device comes back in the very end, and we kind of have a bookmarked thing where we begin a fair bit in this character's mind and then we don't see her again you know we go probably like 300 pages without seeing her and then we end with her as well i'm not a big fan of the framing device but i liked the woman well enough that i would have liked to see her you know having her and mrs muck actually talking but we never see her talking for the rest of the novel we we see her at the beginning and then we don't see her until the end which is very weird because we have all of these stories and experiences that mrs muck went through but then we end on this random woman we haven't seen since the beginning of the chapter and i thought that that felt very empty and also the beginning part i was like maybe i read the end and i liked it more than i liked the beginning and i went back and i read the first chapter the first life and i still didn't like it especially the way that it was talked about i don't know i just didn't like that style so it was a solid three star and i think that i'm going to forget about it sooner than later but it does not rival the last book which is the blue beautiful world and this is at my very bottom of my list of my women's prize books i did not rate it because i would have dnf'd it if it wasn't for the women's prize so i didn't feel like it was fair because i like sci-fi and a lot of people don't like this because they don't like sci-fi and they don't like genre fiction and i have so many problems with that but i love sci-fi but not always space operas and definitely not first contact stories it's just not the genre of science fiction that i like a lot and this is the third in a series, so maybe I felt more confused because of that. And there were elements about like the traveling musicians part that appealed me, but generally I was confused. The world did not feel fully set up to me and these characters felt like flat pancakes that I did not know probably would have been a two star if I had rated it. But I felt bad because I think a lot of people are going to read this for the women's prize and review it badly and I don't think that she deserves that. I read a beautiful post on her Instagram where she talked about her inspiration for it and all of the elements and it feels like she has a great heart under there and that she might really appeal to people who like these kind of stories so I think that it's very unfair that probably a lot of people are going to read this book and review it even when they would never have picked it up normally. So for that reason I would say if you love First Contact, if you love all of these elements, maybe you should give it a try. It was not a book for me, but I want to end on a beautiful note, and that is Remember by Joy Harko. And this is a beautiful picture book by an acclaimed Indigenous poet. I read her book American Sunrise, and yeah, it is illustrated beautifully. It wasn't a picture book that really spoke to me in like any deep meaning. Like I love the ones that have a little bit more words, but it's remembering and like looking to land and looking to those around us and being thankful and I think that is a beautiful message. So tell me something that you are thankful for, tell me a book you read in March, or tell me all of your thoughts about the books that I read. And for those interested in the Women's Prize, I'm currently filming a vlog that will be released once I am done reading all of the books that I have access to, and I will also do a ranking and prediction video closer to the announcement of the prize. I would love to hear your thoughts and have a wonderful day.